Welcome to the Reality Zone. I'm Ed Griffin. The voice you have just heard is that of Major George Racy Jordan, the man who was in charge of shipping war materials to Russia during World War II through the U.S. Air Force Base at Great Falls, Montana. He became the center of controversy in 1949 when he testified before congressional investigating committees that he had received directives from high officials in the State Department and the White House to deliver components of the atomic bomb to the Soviets. At first, he wasn't believed, but Major Jordan had kept a diary, and in that diary he had a detailed record of official directives, phone calls, shipping dates, cargo manifestos, names of the pilots who flew the missions, everything that was needed to confirm that his story was true. When his diaries were published in 1952 by Harcourt Brace and Company, his book was ridiculed by reviewers. Like many others who had tried to warn about treason in high places, he was soon forgotten, and his diaries were relegated to the dustbin of history. In the recording that follows, there are several references that may be unfamiliar to audiences of today. Major Jordan's presentation was made in Los Angeles in 1963, which was a time when there was public concern about communist agents who had infiltrated into key organizations that make up the American political and social fabric. Congressional investigating committees had uncovered shocking evidence that Soviet agents, posing as loyal Americans, had penetrated deeply into every branch of government, the media, schools, even churches. You will hear Jordan mention such names as Alger Hiss, Harry Hopkins, Harry Dexter White, and other high-ranking government officials whose communist affiliations were well known to audiences at that time. And when he mentions the name McNamara, it should be recalled that Robert McNamara was the Secretary of Defense in the Kennedy administration. Today's audiences also may wonder why we bother with such old history, especially why we focus on communism, when, after all, isn't it true that communism is dead? The view from the reality zone is that it definitely is not. True, in the former Soviet bloc, it has changed its name. Communists there now call themselves social democrats, and it has softened its rhetoric. But its underlying ideology and its goal of global dominance has not changed at all. You may have noticed that after communism supposedly went away, the old commissars in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe remained in control of their respective countries. They took off the hats that said communist and replaced them with new ones that said social democrat. But notice, the heads under the hats did not change. It was a strategic ploy to convince the Western world to lower its guard, to disarm, and to send large amounts of financial aid, supposedly to prevent old-style communism from returning. The harsh reality is that very few of the moles that were uncovered in the United States government in the 1960s were ever removed from their positions. They, too, remained in place. After the smoke of publicity cleared away and the voters assumed that their leaders would clean house, most of these agents were actually promoted. By the 1970s, the congressional investigating committees that used to investigate subversion had been closed down, and they have not functioned since. Even local police agencies that had anti-subversion units to protect local communities have been forced to terminate those units. Today, there is virtually no way for the American people to know if communist agents remain in high government positions or anywhere else. We are expected to believe, now that communism has changed its name, that all of these agents just went away and no new ones have come along. We must remember that communism is just a name used to describe a particular variation of collectivism, which is the concept that government is the solution to all problems. Collectivism comes in many different flavors. It may be communism, or socialism, or fascism, or Nazism, or some ism whose name hasn't yet even been invented. But they all have in common the same goal, the building of a superstate with absolute control over its citizens. Communism is not dead. As collectivism, it is thriving at every level of our society. But I'm getting ahead of the story. Let's go back to Major Jordan and his diary. When he speaks of shipping printing plates to the Soviets, he's talking about printing plates for money. 
These plates were intended for the military to print occupational money for circulation in countries that, because of the devastation of war, no longer had money of their own. It was different from U.S. currency, but it could be exchanged for U.S. currency at face value. So, when the Soviets were given these plates for their own use, they were able to print unlimited quantities of occupational money and then exchange them for American dollars, which they promptly did. This expansion of the American money supply was a significant cause of that hidden tax called inflation after World War II. Well, so much for preparing to understand the issues of that day. It's time now to go back to 1963 and hear the story as told by the man who lived it, Major George Racy Jordan. Thank you very much and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When I went back into the service in 1942 as a retread from the First World War, I expected to be assigned as a paper shuffler in the Pentagon. And I had informed General Arnold that uh, I would be willing to uh, do whatever I could to uh, help him in the various assignments that he had in mind. He immediately assigned me to the Russian Air Force as an expediter under the Lend-Lease program, working under Harry Hopkins. And I was assigned to the Newark Airport. It was at Newark that we were shipping a great many things by boat to the Russians, down around Africa and up into Basra, Persia. We were also shipping a great many planes lashed to the decks of boats that went up to Murmansk in northern <coughs> part of Russia. And as I uh, been there about two days, the commanding officer called me and he said that he had just discovered that I'd been a sergeant in the First World War, and of course you folks all know that it really was the sergeants who really won that war, <laughs> and so uh, he wanted to assign me as the executive officer to the Newark airport. So I became acting executive officer with a great many different uh, duties, but my main duty was to see that the Russians got whatever they were supposed to get under the Lend-Lease program. I immediately decided the first thing I should do would be to read the law. The law that your Congress had spelled out exactly what the Russians were to get. So I immediately consulted the act itself, and I found that your Congress had outlined that the Russians were to receive warfare materials only. They were not to receive any money for rehabilitation, and that they were also to get certain items that uh, would be decided by the President of the United States. And the President promptly designated his authority to Harry Hopkins. Therein starts the story. Because as I uh, had the Russians come in to call on me and ask me for various things, I had to refer to Washington to find out if they were supposed to get this or that. And my experience was uh, rather odd because the Russians came up to me and announced that they'd heard about this relief program in the United States. And would I please arrange right away to put them all on relief? <laughs> well, of course, I tried to explain to the Russians through an interpreter that the uh, Lend-Lease program was an entirely different program than the uh, administrative or relief program. So uh, passing the buck, which is an old army custom, I asked them to get in touch with their embassy because I was sure that their embassy would teach them the facts of life. But I was the one that learned, because a few weeks later, this Russian came to me and he thanked me so much for having given him the information as to how to get this relief, because they had had the relief that they wanted. And I said, well now, I don't understand this, let me see the papers, because I uh, knew the law quite well and there was to be no money for relief. But here the government had decided that because the Russians had asked to have the city of Leningrad put on relief, they actually put the city of Leningrad on relief. And when I started to see the amounts of money, I was so astonished that I decided that maybe I better start keeping a few notes. Because I had remembered back in the First World War, there were some officers who went to jail for ordering saddles for the tanks. <laughs> And uh, I was afraid that something like that might be hung on our department. 
So I thought I'd keep a few uh, notes and memorandum as to what was going on. And the first thing that I thought was important was that the Russians are on relief. The city of Leningrad's on relief when they're not supposed to get any relief money. That was the first item. My diary grew from that moment on. And as the Russians came to me for more different things, I became puzzled because I wasn't sending them any warfare material. And when they asked me for copper wire, I thought, copper wire, I don't understand. They wanted copper wire for the rebuilding of the war damage of Russia. Uh, they were deciding to use the Lend-Lease program as a vehicle for rebuilding the damage of Russia after the war was over. And here it was 1942. So uh, at that time, General Eisenhower was preparing for his invasion of Africa, and they needed a great deal of wire for the particular planes that were going down there. There also was a problem that the battleships that had been sunk at Pearl Harbor had been raised off the bottom and were being towed into the Pacific Coast Navy Yards, and uh, they needed 35 to 40 miles of wire for the fire controls on these battleships. But I discovered that I had a priority that was even higher than the United States Army or Navy. And much to my amazement, I found that any time the Army or Navy wanted something, all I had to do was use my priority and I could get it for the Russians. So the Russians wanted the copper wire. So we ordered enough wire to go round the globe at the equator 50 times. Now this wire, there was no shipping space for it, so we put it on wooden spools. And we rented an acre lot, a 20 acres lot up at uh, Hawthorne Circle in New York. And uh, we put the uh, boxes out there that were the uh, wooden spools were in the boxes and the wires, and, and we stored it until after the war was over so that it could be shipped to Russia when we had shipping space to rebuild the communication system of Russia. You must remember that all the time we were hoping we could get our battleships on the ocean to perhaps uh, help to protect us against a possible Japanese invasion of the West Coast, all these admirals were wailing and wringing their hands and screaming for a while. They couldn't get it because we had to get the wire under our priority for the Russians to rebuild the different uh, cities of uh, war damage after the war was over. Well, I sort of decided that my assignment was more important than I'd realized. And uh, I started to uh, make other notes. And then the Russians told me that they were very interested in getting some uh, bomb powder plant. And I thought, well, now we're getting somewhere. This is warfare material. I'll help them get a bomb powder plant. So uh, they started to collect material for a bomb powder plant. But there were strange materials that I'd never heard of. Uranium and heavy water and all kinds of uh, cobalt and uh, things that I didn't know went uh, into a bomb powder plant. And then there was a sudden excited uh, moment when uh, they wanted something very, very special. And I said, all right, what is it? What can I do to help you? Well, at that time, we were very short of tankers. The tankers that had been flying up the uh, east coast of the United States had been picked off one by one by the uh, German wolf pack. And we now had balloons out over the ocean, dirigibles, ranging far at sea to look for the German submarine wolf pack so they wouldn't pick off the few tankers that we had left. But they were all ordered suddenly through the Panama Canal up into Seattle so they could handle this special program. And that was the program that we uh, later found out what it was. We shipped a hundred million dollars worth of vodka to Russia. It took 55 days to go across the Pacific. And this hundred million dollars worth of alcohol and all the necessary flavoring extracts and the glycerin and all the rest of it had to go uh, with special pilots to go through the Japanese minefields. And then when they got over there, there was a 55-day trip back. It was quite a program, but we got the vodka to them. Of course, I do realize that we got some of it back in diplomatic containers at Yalta. <laughs> but uh, the uh, entire situation had gotten to a point where I decided that uh, I must keep a very minute diary, if possible, to find out all of the things that the Russians were getting, because I had a feeling that the State Department, under Charles Bolin, was giving the Russians diplomatic immunity for things that, uh, which I didn't approve, and I had a little idea that I ought to get reports in to the proper authorities. So I talked to the uh, counterintelligence and other people, and I started telling them what was going on. And in each case, I found that the Russians had the highest kind of authority for anything that they wanted. And uh, there were so many things that they were going through that had nothing whatever to do with the war effort. 
that I was really dumbfounded as to uh, why they weren't getting warfare material. They were getting all these things that uh, seemed to be strange to me, but it had a pattern. And the pattern was that they were using the Lend-Lease program for the rebuilding of the war damage of Russia. Now, I had a lady once that said to me, she said, well, Major Jordan, she said, aren't you kicking about a few motors while the Russians were giving their lives? And I said, well, now, just a moment. You're the one that mentioned motors, and I want to tell you that the motors that I talked about were generators. Now, uh, the Russians themselves blew up the Dnieperstroy Dam, and they tried to drown the German army. So why should the taxpayers of this country rebuild the Dnieperstroy Dam to give them the power necessary to build their atom bomb? So I didn't think it was the right thing, but these motors that we sent to them, it was $222 million were the motors, and uh, some of them were four stories high that uh, were generators to go into the Dnieperstroy Dam to rebuild the power that was necessary to put Russia into a capacity to be an industrial nation. Quite a little time later, we moved out to Great Falls, Montana from Newark, and we started uh, shipping the planes uh, instead of uh, by boat. We started flying them from Great Falls up through into Fairbanks, and the Russian pilots took over, and then through Siberia. And we were actually loading the guns in uh, Great Falls until one day we had a plane that burned up on the runway, and all these cannon and uh, machine guns were headed towards the city of Great Falls, and all I could think of was that the fire was going to hit the uh, cannon, and in a few minutes we'd be blowing up the schoolhouses and everything else in Great Falls. So we managed to get a rope around the tail of the plane and turn it around so it headed toward the forest. And uh, I gave orders from then on that the Russians wanted any ammunition, let them take it over by boat. I wouldn't load any more planes in Great Falls. And I signed, incidentally, for 16,000 airplanes that went to the Russians at Great Falls, Montana. And that was only half of it because there was another 16,000 went through Basra, Persia, that went through other sources. So the Russians got around 32,000 airplanes from us, and we were shipping a plane through Great Falls to the Russians, three planes an hour, eight hours a day. We were shipping a plane into the battle line every 20 minutes. Now, uh, that's quite a lot of planes. And uh, the Russians wanted to know if I would help them to get permission to load the uh, back of the navigator's compartment with 50-pound packages. And I said, why, certainly. Uh, the only thing is, I'd like to look at the packages. Oh, they said, well, these packages are super secret. You can't see these packages. I said, why not? Oh, they said, they, they, we have top diplomatic immunity. Well, I said, all right, then you can keep them on the ground. I won't let them go on the plane. So then they wanted to compromise. And I said, all right, what's the compromise? They said, we'll tell you what's in the packages. Well, I said, I wouldn't believe you under any circumstances. <laughs> Finally, it was decided that the State Department would know what was in the packages, but I wouldn't. So I said, there's such a thing as an Inspector General in the Army, and if the Inspector General comes around and says to me, Major Jordan, what are the Russians shipping out in those packages? What am I going to say? Some guy in the State Department knows what they're doing. I am not. I'm going to know or you're not going to get them off the ground. So finally, they let me look at the packages. They were simple packages. They were the patents from the Patent Office. Uh, somebody in Washington <laughs> had decided that it would be nice if we shipped the patent office to Moscow. They were behind us in industrial uh, technical know-how, so uh, uh, someone in the top echelon had decided it would be nice if the Russians could have the privileges that you and I as American citizens don't have. If you go to Washington and you put 15 cents on the counter, you can get a copy of any patent if you know the number to ask for. But in case the Russians didn't know what numbers to ask for, they were allowed down the hall through a door to browse in the uh, department and uh, take the numbers, and then they'd go around in the front and they'd lay down checks for $5,000. Every afternoon, day after day, five days a week, a check for $5,000, that buys an awful lot of patents at 15 cents. Of course, I know there were simple patents, like the Norden bombsite, and... Uh, <laughs> special undercarriages for fighter planes and all kinds of Navy observation radar and all that sort of thing. There are patents that are government developed and are not in any catalog that you'll find because they were developed by the government. So therefore, they're not in the catalog, but the Russians were shipping out $5,000 worth of them a day. And I had two million pounds in 50-pound packages in a warehouse. I didn't have shipping space for them. And everything was AA, and then AAA, and then AAAA priority, and there were certain packages of patents they wanted. Why, it would take them 50 years to even open the bundles. So I decided to go to Washington. And I went down to Washington, I wandered around down there in the Pentagon, and I started to talk to people about what was going on, and I started to talk to the State Department, and they said, oh, we know what's going on. 
We, we're the ones that gave them permission. We're the ones that arranged all these things. And you just go back to the Great Falls and you do your duty as an expediter, and if you don't, why, we'll ship you to some small island in the South Pacific, you know, where the girls don't wear much and just flowers in their hair or something. <laughs> well, I didn't want to go to one of those small islands in the South Pacific. So I started to sending information to counterintelligence, and I had a stream of counterintelligence men that were coming through Great Falls. And finally it was decided that because I had done such a good job, and I was a First World War veteran, I would be given the privilege of retiring before the rest of the fellows. <laughs> and uh, the other fellows, when they went out, they'd all get the good jobs, and they were going to let me out first so I could get a good job. Well, I'd worked for McGraw Hill Publishing Company for years, and I could go back there. But I was tired, and I decided to go out. And when I got out of the Army, uh, I had all these file cabinets of all this information about what went to Russia. And I thought it would be smart to uh, turn it over to the Air Corps. So I talked to one of the officers in the Air Corps, and I said, the State Department has been lying to you fellows. I said, now I've got the data that will actually show you what the State Department did, and uh, uh, you can protect the Air Corps against the lion cookie pushers in the State Department. And uh, nobody seemed to want these records. Uh, they were all afraid of them. And so I hung on to them for a while until the one day it was announced in the paper that a three-ounce bottle of uranium was missing. And there was headlines in all the papers about the uranium that was missing. And uh, the public mustn't get excited because they had 600 police out on the ash dumps with Geiger counters looking for this three-ounce bottle of uranium. They wouldn't let the Russians get it. So I'm standing in front of a bulletin board there in the Army-Navy Club, and there was a couple of officers standing there, and they were talking about, gee, if the Russians ever get that three-ounce bottle, we're sunk. <laughs> and uh, one of them said to the other, said, why, the entire policy of the Pentagon is predicated on the fact that uh, the Russians won't get the atom bomb for 15 to 20 years, and there's that three-ounce bottle gone, and some spy has got it. So I turned around casually to these officers, and I said, don't worry about it. I used to ship the Russians uranium in 100-pound boxes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, these officers not only didn't believe it, but they sort of went this way, you know. He used to be a nice fellow. And, but, you know, since the First World War, he's gotten a little dippy and so forth. And uh, nothing more was said for the moment, till a few days later, there was a big headline in all the papers in which Truman had announced, Russia has the atom bomb. And then these officers came running back to the Army Navy Club, and they said, where's that Major Jordan? Where's that fellow who used to ship uranium to the Russians? And I was asked to go over to see Stiles Bridges, and I went over to see Senator Bridges, and Senator Bridges started off by swinging his glasses and staring at me and said, now you've never been incarcerated in a mental institution, have you? <laughs> I said, no, sir, and I think they'd have trouble. Well, he said, there wouldn't be any trouble at all. They'd put you right over to Elizabeth Hospital, and he said, if you use the word uranium, you shipped uranium, you said you shipped uranium, they'd put you in Elizabeth Hospital. Well, I said, they'd have trouble because I got a diary. <laughs> He's a diary. What have you got in your diary? Oh, I said, the plane number and the pilot and the number of the planes and the poundage and the day it went and who flew the plane and all that sort of business. I said, got it all in the diary. Well, the fat was really in the fire. And I was subpoenaed by the various uh, committees of Congress, and from then on, you may remember that Fulton Lewis had the program on the air, and I was, uh, uh, overnight, I became what is known as a controversial figure. <laughs> and then I was on one of these radio programs where these reporters all look at you and uh, with gimlet eyes and say, well now, uh, what do you think the senators should have asked you that they didn't ask you? Well, I said, there weren't any of those senators asked me about those master plates of the treasury that I shipped Russia so they could print our money. <laughs> Two hours later, I was subpoenaed by the Banking and Currency Committee. <laughs> and Senator Munt sitting there was smoking his pipe and all these senators looking at me, you know, and they said, now, uh, we've heard rumors. Uh, nothing's ever been definite. Now, uh, is this something that you heard secondhand, or do you uh, know about it uh, in some manner? Did you hear who did it or what? 
Well, sir, I said I sent 23 plates positive and 23 negatives and 52 barrels of ink and all the paraphernalia and copies of the money that were fine plate and loads of paper. I said, what else do you want to know? <laughs> So for the first time, they pinned down the story of how the Russians got the master plates for printing the occupation money. Now, of course, the GIs have never been known to overlook anything. So when they discovered that they could buy Crisco in the post exchange or nylon hosiery or something and take it down to the Mujiks, they'd look at these Russians because the Russians would have different uh, denominations of money. And they'd find the Russian that had the 50 mark note or the 100 mark note and they'd sell them the Crisco. Because, you see, the Mujiks can't read. <laughs> so General Clay was so upset when he found he'd redeemed $350 million more than he'd issued, <laughs> he said, there must be a mistake around here somewhere. <laughs> so they went over to Marshal Zwickoff and they said to Marshal Zwickoff, you have the same money we have? How much did we give you? And Marshal Zwickoff said, what do you mean? He said, well, we gave the British so much and the French so much and the Benelux country so much. How much did we give you? And Marshal Zwickoff says, oh, we, the Russian army, when we want money, we push switch and light puts it and the money comes out press. <laughs> General Clay says, you mean you're printing it? You're printing our money? Well, he sent word right away to General Marshall. He said, the Russians are using the same money we're using. I don't know how they got it, but he said, there's an awful foul up here. He said, I've redeemed 354 million more than uh, I, I've issued, and uh, what'll I do? And they came back over the intercom, and General Marshall said, didn't they put a distinguishing mark in front of the serial number like they promised me they would? <laughs> well, of course the Russians weren't putting any distinguishing mark in front of the serial number. They were pulling it out of the presses at Leipzig and they were taking it down to the German homes and they were buying the silverware and the table furnishing. They were buying all the household furnishing, putting it on trucks and they were sending it back into Russia. And the German people were taking it down in the banks and General Frank Howley told me one day, he said, why? He said, we got so upset that we called Marshal Zwick on and he said, we want a list here of how much you've printed. He said, I took a look at it and General Clay took a look at it and he said, we knew right away they were lying because there wasn't any thousand mark notes on there. There was a one mark, half mark and all those, but uh, 10 marks, 50 marks, 100 mark and 500 marks, but no thousand mark notes. That was known as the military M certificates of the occupation forces. But there was no thousand mark notes on there. So they told Marshal Zwickau that this is palpably a fraud. And he said, why? What's wrong? Well, General Howley said, when I came over here, I phoned down to the Berlin banks and I found out that they'd already redeemed 3 million 1,000 mark notes. And that cost the taxpayers an awful lot of money. So General Marshall and uh, the rest of them, they decided to stop the uh, occupation money. They had a new military certificate issued. They had to give the German people a certain amount of time. And uh, in the meantime, uh, the uh, congressional investigation, which had been triggered from uh, my uh, testimony, uh, turned up with the information that it cost the taxpayers two billion eight hundred and eighty-eight millions of dollars to allow the Russians to have a pipeline in our treasury to print our money. So that you can get involved in an awful lot of commotion in the army if you uh, just know just what to do. To uh, <coughs> I uh, I remembered how this started. Um, I had uh, been uh, noticing a loss of a lot of pistols. So I knew the Russians were stealing my pistols. And what was they going to do? I was accountable at that time for about $2 billion worth of material. And uh, that was uh, too much stealing of pistols. So we had a flying fortress that went down and burned up. And I thought, well, now I'd learned as a sergeant in the First World War how to get rid of accountability. So uh, I, uh, <laughs> I announced that all the pistols that I'd been missing were on this flying fortress that was going down. <laughs> And uh, everything went fine until I got a telephone call. It said on the intercom, Major Jordan, General Staff Officer wants you, General Lautzenheiser's on the wire. So I went to the phone and with a little, uh, I says, uh, Major Jordan speaking, sir. He says, what do you take me for? Well, well I said, well, a comrade in arms, sir. <laughs> well, uh, he says, you know how much uh, 5,000 pistols would weigh? Well, I said, no, sir, I don't. Why? Well, he said, uh, there was a flying fortress went down out there. He said, then, uh, uh, how much uh, was the uh, capacity of that plane? I said, about uh, 4,000 pounds of freight. He said, 4,000 pounds of freight. And you had 11,000 pounds of pistols went down. No wonder the plane went down. <laughs> he 
He said, uh, <clears throat> now listen here, Major Jordan. I said, uh, General, the, the Russians were stealing my pistols and they're, they're, they're stealing everything. They're stealing their eyeballs out here. I said, they're stealing the gold off the dome in the Capitol. He said, there isn't any gold on the dome in the Capitol. I said, well, the Russians have got it. Uh, well, he says, <laughs> where did you learn accountability? Well, sir, I said uh, in the First World War, the Battle of the Bellow Woods, the uh, Shadow Theory, the Wazain, the Orc, the Veal, the Samuel, the Argonne, the Muse Argonne. Oh, he said, uh, what was your rank? I said, I was just a top sergeant. Oh, that accounts for it. <laughs> well, he said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to cut some orders for yourself and come down here to Washington and report to my office and make a speech to the War College on accountability. <laughs> so that's how I went to Washington and I went to General Lotzenheiser's office and I talked to him a little bit and he had me out at the War College telling them about the impact between the ideologies, the Russian ideology and the American ideology. And I explained to these uh, assembled colonels, uh, I said that uh, when I ate my meals with the Russians, I noticed that they'd be eating and they were terribly funny. They'd stab rolls with forks and they ate with their elbows and all that sort of business. And I used to look around. I'd never seen such an exhibit in my life because they all spoke different languages. They spoke 150 different languages. They couldn't even speak to each other, so they'd stab each other to <laughs> the food to get it. I noticed that right in the middle of all this, they'd stop. They'd put their hands under the table and they'd look down like this. I knew very well they weren't saying grace. <laughs> So I knew if I asked my interpreters of what happened, why they stopped and put their hands on the table, I'd never find out. So I started to watch, and I couldn't figure out why. And then Mrs. Molotov arrived. She was in charge of the cosmetic trust. You know, she came over here to get a supply of wholesale beeswax or something. <laughs> and uh, she was going to get supplies for the cosmetic trust. And when she arrived on the scene, I told the tower, I said, send her around once more and I get the red carpet out for her. And I get all the Russians lined up. And I went into the office and I said to the Russians, Mrs. Molotov's above. She's coming down in five minutes. You better get out there and give her the VIP treatment. And to my amazement, all these generals and colonels, and it was one admiral, they ran in the warehouse and they ducked and they put blankets over their head and they hid out in the warehouse. And I was left all alone to go out and meet some Mrs. Molotov. And I didn't know what to do and I thought, well, uh, what, what's happened here? I thought these fellows were all such high rankers. And then I noticed a little mechanic out the window. I noticed a little mechanic washing his hands on gasoline and uh, he went out and he started to talk to Mrs. Molotov like a Dutch uncle. And he'd ever, he did everything but slap her on the bustle. And, uh, <laughs> And Mrs. Molotov was trying to explain this, and she was explaining that, and this fellow was laying down the Lord or, and I stood there in a trance, and I said, that little fellow, the Magneto man, he must be the boss around here. He must be the top man in this place. And then it dawned on me that every time I'd ask a colonel or a Russian something, he'd have to go downstairs and walk around outside to think it over before I'd get the answer. Well, I knew he'd been going into the magneto room, and that must be the fellow that had been putting the dictographs around. We all used to look under the tables and all around for dictographs. I used to help them. Uh, <laughs> they weren't afraid of me. I had one in the telephone. They didn't know about it, and every time they made a phone call, it went down to an FBI man in the coal bin, and he took the record of it. But that they didn't know. I used to help them look around the curtains for dictographs, and this was the fellow that was evidently putting them around. So I told all this to the War College, and when I was in their headquarters in Washington, uh, was in the uh, Soviet Government Purchasing Commission, I heard one of the Russians say to the elevator operator, he want to get out to the seventh floor. And they all looked at him, and they all straightened up, and why, well, the fellow had done something terrible. He'd asked to get off at the seventh floor. So I couldn't understand that, and I thought, well, that's funny. So I went upstairs and changed elevators and got in, and I stood there, and I was all in uniform, and I said, seventh floor, please. This fellow looked at me and he says, nobody. Not even General Rudenko or General Belyaev can get off at the uh, seventh floor. Well, I says, why? Oh, he says, you, you must go ask somebody. And everybody stood and looked up at the ceiling and I thought, well, that's all right. Now I'm going to find out something. So I went up to the 10th floor and they had an elevator, I mean a fire escape exit, and I went down three floors and I wrapped on the door of the Soviet Government Purchasing Commission on 16th Street in Washington, D.C., in a building that had been turned over to them for their affairs, and I wrapped on the door, and the door opened, and the man stuck a bar gun right in my stomach. But over his shoulder, I saw in the room, and all over the floor of the room, and two or three feet high, were piles 
of documents and secrets from the State Department that they were putting all around on the floor, and the uh, man in the middle of the room, who seemed to be running the whole show, was the little man from the Magneto room out in Great Falls, Montana. So it, uh, first thing I could do when I disengaged myself from the butt end of a gun, I went upstairs again, and I didn't ask for the seventh floor, but I went over to counterintelligence, and I said, say, listen, you know that government building over there they gave to the Russians? I said, well, all the birds that are stealing everything are on the seventh floor. And they said, well, what do you want us to do about it? Well, I said, you ought to do something about it. They said, don't you know that uh, that, uh, that all has, they have the permission of uh, the State Department? And uh, I said, well, who's giving them all those documents? They're taking scissors and cutting the word secret off the top of all the documents and scalloping them all so that the word confidential or secret or something is taken off. I said, well, you ought to ground the whole bunch of them. Well, he said, uh, you better just forget that and don't mention that you were over here. So, of course, when I got out of the Army, and I was asked by these different people, these questions and subpoenaed about them, I told them everything that I could because I wanted them to realize that this was an entire, the whole setup was a conspiracy. And there were people in our State Department that were part of the apparatus. And there were people in the State Department that were helping them and telling them how to get around the Joint Chiefs of Staff. How, if the Joint Chiefs of Staff said they couldn't have a wasp motor, and the Joint Chiefs meant business. They weren't to get any wasp motors. I didn't like to see the big Catalinas with six wasp motors flown to the Aleutian Islands and cannibalized and dropped in the ocean and the wasp motors shipped over to Russia because our Joint Chiefs of Staff said they weren't to get one. So I was the liaison link to help the Russians get the things that were supposed to go under the Lend-Lease program, but I also had basic training in the security, the basic security of this country that I was trying to see that they didn't get the things they were supposed to get that the Joint Chiefs of Staff didn't want them to get. And of course, that's how I became so controversial. And one of the things that I testified that they got was they got all the gold mining machinery that was taken away from the miners out at the mother load. And it was assembled at Seattle. And when we had the shipping space, we shipped all this gold mining equipment to Russia. And so that they, with the slave labor and the new gold mining equipment, could get into the gold producing business. And while this was going on, Harry Dexter White and Alger Hiss had enmeshed us into the monetary fund agreement through the Bretton Woods situation so that we were tied in in such a way that we couldn't raise the price of gold. In 1942, Harry Dexter White wrote an order, L-208, and that order closed all the gold mines. And when the gold mines were closed, they filled up immediately full of water. You can close a factory and go back later, but you close a gold mine and immediately it fills full of water and it takes a great deal of money to unwater a mine. So here was some more testimony that I had given that uh, was beginning to cause trouble. I was getting myself involved in another whole commotion because all the gold mines that were closed wanted me to make out affidavits that I had taken their machinery and shipped it to Russia, and they were still closed. So I made out affidavits for them, and 252 gold mines sued Uncle Sam for taking in the machinery and keeping them closed. Now, we had 9,000 closed gold mines in the United States. They're still closed. There's only one or two of them that are beginning to open. And as I uh, went to California and I became a speaker at the various rotaries and I went to the Commonwealth Club, I told these people, I told them how it happened and how Harry Dexter White and Alger Hiss with the connivance of people in the banking department had tied us into an international situation so that we couldn't raise the price of gold without the permission of the other people. And they didn't want to give us permission because the dollar in 1934, when the price of gold was fixed to $35 an ounce, the dollar had gone down to a 40 cent dollar. So that if they received 35 paper tokens called a dollar, they weren't getting $35 in value, which made it possible for them to open their mind. They couldn't open their minds. So here we are, one of the great gold producers of the world, and we're tight as a drum, closed up. We can't do anything about it. In the meantime, Russia's mining gold putting it into the world's markets, and she's trying to break the dollar. And they're trying to break the free enterprise system. They want to break the capitalistic system. And we, of course, are feeding into the situation by we have 73 army bases around the world. And if you think any one of those army bases can fire a shot, you don't understand the situation. We have a treaty with every one of those nations. We couldn't fire a shot if we wanted to. 
because we have a treaty with each country that we will allow the country to decide whether we can fire a shot in uh, self-defense practically. And secondly, we have to go back to the United Nations where the Political Action Committee is headed by a Russian. General Moran was telling you today about Arkady Sobolov was the head of that commission, uh, that committee, and uh, the second committee down from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Arkady Sobolov, he sits there and they just think he's a clerk. He was the Assistant Secretary of War of Russia. I knew those fellows. When they came in the United States, they had to go by my desk and I had to look at their passport. And I kept a record of them. I gave the FBI over 400 and some odd names of Russians I didn't think they had any record of that were in this country. <laughs> When uh, Arkady Sobolov left, he was the Assistant Secretary of War of Russia, Konstantin Zinchenko went in, and he was a public relations general of the Russian army. And then Ilya Semenovich Chernyshev went in, and he was Mikoyan's right-hand assistant. And then there was Kisilov, and now we got Sobolov. And uh, there was one fellow in there, Dobryan, that was out of Russia, and he was a Yugoslav. But the point is, you've got 73 army bases around the world. What are they there for if they can't fight? They can spend money. They can take from the have countries and give to the have not countries. They can spend money in these places and the money then comes back to the short term obligations of the central banks of Europe as a green dollar that has to be redeemed in gold. The reason that this affects everyone in this room is because you've got these green paper tokens they call dollars and uh, they're going down in purchasing power every year according to the testimony of McChesney Martin he says they're taking them down scientifically at three and a quarter to three and a half percent per year now if your dollars are going down at three and a half percent per year and you've got a government bond and you're getting maybe four percent on your bond and you're paying income tax on the four percent and you're losing three and a half percent of your value through the erosion of your money it's planned that way why these Fabian socialist planners from Harvard that come down on that egghead express to Washington, those fellows are the fellows that are doing it. They're planning your future for you. They're planning to take the money down in purchasing power so that they'll get it down where they can manage it. They want to have managed money. You try to buy real estate and they're going to tax the real estate because the police and fire departments and all these other departments that give such good service have got to have more money because their dollars are going down every time they go in a grocery store and it takes them ten dollars to buy a basket of groceries that in 1940 they could have paid three dollars and seventy five cents for just wait another year or so it's going to cost twelve dollars fourteen dollars sixteen dollars eighteen dollars and it hits the poor people that are on the fixed income bracket people who are on a fixed income you're going to have less and less and less purchasing power all the time and as you have less purchasing power it's going to be just exactly as it was planned because these social democrats, now I don't have the heart to call them democrats because they're not the kind of democrats that I used to know like Jim Farley. Uh, they're a peculiar breed of one-worlders down there now. They want to break this system so that we'll, they'll be able to maneuver us into a one-world government where they'll have one army, one navy, and one money. And then you won't have the freedom of choice. That is the overall plan. Now, as a military man, there are certain things I object to. I'm going to give you an idea of why I'm willing to go thousands of miles to make these appearances and to meet all you nice folks because there's things that make me mad. I'm very angry about an investigation in Washington wherein they called in the union and uh, they fired this union out of the CIO because they were too communists. It was called the American Communications Association. And this American Communications Association that was thrown out for being too communist, even for Walter Ruther, Murray, Phil Murray insisted on kicking them out, and Ruther had to go along with them. They kicked them out of the CIO because of their communism. So now those men have charge of all the tie lines going into the Pentagon and the Central Intelligence and State Department. So they got the Secretary of War on the witness stand in a hearing in 1954, which is nine years ago. And they asked the Secretary of War, they said to him, Mr. Brucker, do you know that all the tie lines and telephone lines and telegraph lines going in and out of the Pentagon, that they are monitored by an organization that's controlled in Moscow? And your Secretary of War sat there and he says, yes, I know that. In fact, uh, we're very much concerned about it. <laughs>
And finally, one of the senators said to this uh, Secretary of War, he said, well, what are you doing about it? And the Secretary of War said, under the National Labor Relations Act, there isn't anything I can do about it. He doesn't seem to realize that Lee Pressman, who was an admitted communist under the stand, wrote the National Labor Relations Act and bragged about it and said Wagner never saw it and he didn't even know what it was until after he saw his name on it. Now, uh, that is the act that makes it impossible because, like Gulliver, we're being tied down with all these little strings. You can't change the situation where all of the monitoring of all these tie lines and the cables and the scrambling machines that go in and out of our top secret uh, organizations are all monitored by an organization that is over and over again, the Senate Sub-Security Committee has said that this is a, an organization controlled from Moscow. And they all sit there, and the other day I visited a three-star general in the Pentagon. And as I was ushered in, he went this way. And I went over, and he, I didn't know what was the matter, and he had to turn on the Blue Danube waltz so it would be music in the room before we could <laughs> greet each other. <laughs> and I shook hands with him, and I said, what's this? He said, oh, I can't be too careful. He said, when I have somebody like you here, he said, we're going to kind of have a little chat. He said, i got to have the Blue Danube waltz. And he said, if there's any dictographs around here, he said, they'll get music and a lot of, a lot of mushmash. He said, they will be able to tell what we're saying. I said, well, gee, that's good. Uh, <laughs> So I said, well, General, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was that, uh, did you know that McNamara down the hall down here, he's got an assistant by the name of Adam Yarmolinsky. Oh, <laughs> well, I said, what's the matter? Well, uh, no. well, I said, Adam Yarmolinsky is McNamara's right-hand man, and he used to publish a communist newspaper. And he's got a record in the Appendix 9, tells all about Mr. I, Adam Yarmolinsky. He was up at the Ford Foundation, and uh, he's got a bad record. And what's he doing in McNamara's office? Well, it seems that uh, President Kennedy gave McNamara the permission to bring his own staff. So he rounds up these commies and takes them down there in the Pentagon where I can't get in, and I'm a veteran of the First World War, I can't get in without a pass, and, and if I get in as far as I could go, I gotta go by Yarmolinsky to get the McNamara. Those are the kind of things that I don't like. I object to those kind of things. I served in the Rickenbacker Squadron in the First World War. I spent 28 months in the front line in France. And I have a feeling, a feeling is in my fiber that those are the kind of things we could correct, we should correct, and we've got to correct. <laughs> Why should a little pipsqueak by the name of Adam Yarmolinsky sit next to McNamara and it says on the door, special assignments. Why, he can call anything he wishes a special assignment. And McNamara has the nerve to bring one of those fellows in. And now, of course, this is not the first time it's happened, and I want to tell you that the Communist Party had a prize once. It was a contest of some kind to get the most number of new members in the party. And it was announced in all the Communist papers, the one that gets the most number of Communists is going to win a prize. And this fellow, Followed by the name of Lynn Lemoyne Prout out here in your neck of the woods out here. Uh, he won the prize. He got the most number of communists in the party. So he went to New York and he met Browder. And Browder said, you're a fine, upstanding young communist. We're going to give you a prize. We're going to promote you. We're going to give you a big promotion. This was in 1941, before Pearl Harbor. So what did this man get as a prize for winning the most number of communists over to communism? Why, they sent him in the office of the chief of staff of the United States Army to examine the deaths of the generals to make sure they were locked according to security regulations. <laughs> and when they had him on the witness stand later, when I gave his record to Senator Ferguson, and uh, they had him on the stand, they asked him, they said, what else did you do? Oh, he said, I looked at the general's incoming and outgoing boxes to make sure they were in order and gave them rubber bands and blotters and rulers and things that they needed. And he said they were all very busy. And of course, as uh, the president has said, they were very competent to the task to which they were assigned. And when Mrs. Clinton asked the president about uh, William A. Whelan and Roe Bonham and some of the others, you know, that were in the State Department, he was visibly angry, and he, and he leaned down and he said, they are very competent for the task to which they are assigned. Why, certainly they are. 
They're all communists and they're specially trained for their jobs and that's why they're so efficient. And this fellow, when they asked him, they said, well now you're in the office of the chief of staff. What happened? Well, he testified that uh, he was promoted. He was made personnel manager for the Secretary of War when war broke out and the busy Secretary of War was so busy with the war that he's a fellow that graded and evaluated and hired the personnel for the Secretary of War. And then when the war was almost over, why they promoted him to Quartermaster General's office where he was in charge of the personnel in the depots throughout the world, Guam, China, Africa, and India, putting the personnel and grading him and evaluating him. And when I gave this information to Senator Ferguson, it was 8 o'clock in the morning and the Senator was going to a committee meeting and he had a glass of milk in his hand and his hand was trembling so he was spilling the milk and he said, well, Major Jordan, I can't take it. He said, the, uh, that man could have put all kinds of people in the, the War Department. I said, yes. And I said, you want to know where he is now? He says, uh, well, let's arrest him. He's personnel bound to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation financing communist projects around, you know, urban renewal and all that sort of thing. <laughs> now, this has got to the point where uh, I say I'm mad, I'm frustrated to think that this great, wonderful country of ours is being so infiltrated with termites in the woodwork and we can't get them out because there's a reason why we can't get this one out and there's a reason why we can't get that one out. What we need to do is to raise the integrity level of the people in Washington and kill them all out. <laughs> This program is from the audio archives of The Reality Zone. For more information, visit our website at www.realityzone.com or call our toll-free number, 800-595-6596. That number again is 800-595-6596. The Reality Zone is a subsidiary of American Media.